this morning after um, David uh, modified the Einstein equation. I'm going to discuss a little bit how to modify Schrodinger equation. And I must also say that I sort of disagree with David what he said this morning that he thought that uh, GR or I mean gravity was the weirdest interaction we know of. Well, from my point of view, I think this is the only interaction we understand basically what it means. Whereas uh, quantum, anything which has to do with quantum is essentially impossible to understand. Well, at least I will try not to, uh, well, I will try to show how it is possible to understand somehow these things. And so um, I enjoyed pretty much the view from the elevator, which is why I just reproduced it from here. So uh, just as David did, uh, I will do the same kind of things as he began with an introduction uh, to general relativity, then I will begin with an introduction to quantum mechanics. And so you will see that this, ah, great. this is all going to be very simple. And I, I'm pretty bad at complicated things, so I'm good at simple things. So I will explain some simple things. So let me just remind you what quantum mechanics of closed system are. I'm going to be interested in closed system because I'm going to consider the universe at the end of the day. And there is hardly anything more closed as a system than the universe itself, <laughs> by definition. And so just to remind you, the physical system in quantum mechanics is defined, essentially, as a Hilbert space of configurations. You see, it's very physical. You know, it's very, it has a very deeply rooted physical meaning. So you have a Hilbert space of configuration in which you have state vectors. One of them is describing the actual state of your system. And you have observable, which are self-adjoint operator. And any time you make a measurement, this measurement is producing the result uh, uh, as an eigenvalue of this observable, which by definition is something you can observe. Now, the evolution of the wave function, you, your state vector, is defined by a wave function. And the evolution of this wave function is known as the Schrodinger equation, which merely reflects time translation invariance. And it takes this form with a Hamiltonian operator here. So that's one part of the dynamics. And the second part is provided by the Born rule, which is telling you what is the probability to measuring one of these eigenvalues. I told you you can only measure one of the eigenvalues of the self adjoint operator, which are the observables. Then the probability of this is simply the projection of the, um, of the Schrodinger state over the eigenvector squared. And now, then, what you know is that you collapse the wave function. You had any psi of t before the measurement, and you have this special eigenvector right after the measurement. And from that point on, you continue the evolution. So you see that basically quantum mechanics is described by a Schrodinger equation, which is the linear equation satisfying the superposition principle as its root, basically. It is essentially a unitary evolution. Then you have this wave packet reduction given by the Born rule. This is nonlinear. Of course, you start with one state, you end up instantaneously into another state. This is nonlinear and stochastic because you only have probabilities. So in other words, in other words, I will have to put this thing somewhere else. So in other words, oh yeah, and I forgot to mention something which is crucial in cosmology. Of course, you need an external observer. This is obviously going to be a problem in cosmology. As far as I can tell, there is no such thing as an external observer in the universe. But in any case, these two different evolutions are uh, mutually incompatible. And this is, uh, for me, the starting point of the problem. Now what you do, in general, what is it which you do with your theories? You want to predict something from your quantum theory, and you want to apply that, of course, to cosmology. You know, so basically, you have an operator, an observable, whatever it is. And then you calculate the quantum average in the quantum state you're in. And then this is it. That's all you can calculate. You can calculate, basically, averages of your state. Yeah, but when you think of it, there is a linear uh, unitary evolution and the measurement process, which is normally nothing but another uh, unitary evolution. It should be unitary evolution and it's not. It's nonlinear and it's stochastic. So these are, you know, at some stage when you make a measurement, then you imply you use a different rule to make your measurement and then you move on. 
So this is why this, in a way, it is mutually incompatible. But I will present solution to that problem, of course. So now, okay, you calculate the quantum average in your state. So yeah. Incompatible doesn't mean inconsistent. Yes, indeed. In your opinion, you mean you are telling us that it's inconsistent? No, I'm telling you it's incompatible. Okay. And I'm telling you I don't like it. That's true, but as far as I can tell, you can apply Feynman's idea of shut up and calculate, and you can make all the calculation predictions and compare with experiment, and it works very well. And that brings me back to what it is what you are actually doing, when you're doing that. So you pre the prediction is the quantum average in a given state of a given observable. And so in a lab, what you do, you repeat this experiment, whatever it was, a very large number of time, and then you have an ensemble average over the experiment, which you claim is equivalent to the quantum average, which, you are, which is the only thing you can calculate. And indeed, this is working amazingly well, and you're very happy with that. Now, in, co in cosmology, it's a little bit problematic. Of course, the first thing, repeat the experiment, is immediately putting you into trouble in cosmology. You don't repeat the experiment, you have only one, which is the universe. So you have the single universe. So now you apply to an ergodicity kind of principle, which is more involving than anything else in a way, but anyway. So you suppose that you can spatially average over all various directions in the sky, which is therefore possible only for small angles. And then you have the, the problem. Of course, this is where the cosmic variance problem comes into the game. And again, then you assume that this spatial average is, again, equivalent to the quantum average. And the only reason why people believe that is that it, it's because it works. Otherwise, you wouldn't believe that. This is, there is absolutely no reason why the ensemble average of our experiments, which you cannot repeat, would be equivalent to the spatial average over the sky. So, especially since most of these um, spatial averaging in the sky are made in a sphere, and it is known that there is no ergodic principle on the sphere. So this is, again, but yet again another problem. So that drives me to the measurement problem in quantum, in quantum mechanics, in ordinary quantum mechanics. You see, let's assume I prepare a bunch of, say, electrons aligned along this direction, which is the x direction. So you see the initial wave function is just uh, up and down combination, linear combination of up and down states in the z direction if I want to measure it in the z direction. And then I have my stern gerlach apparatus, right? So this is my initial state. All these, the wave function is there, so it will just throw my particles over there, and you know what will happen. They will be deflected by the magnetic field. Those that happen to be in the up direction will go in the up direction, and those that are in the down direction will go downward, right? So this is provided normally by the unitary Schrodinger evolution, which is simply you take the final wave function, which is the, just the exponential of the Hamiltonian of the stern gerlach apparatus applied on the initial wave function. And you end up with this very simple result, which is all calculated for. Now the problem is that what you actually measure, any time you send one electron, what you measure is the stern and Galak apparatus measuring the electron in the plus in up position with, of course, the electron in the upward position, or this thing. In other words, you, you, you sort of measure, you start with a pure state and you sort of measure a mixed state. What I mean is, you see, this is what you measure. This is the typical kind of track. This is by repeating the experiment number of times, and you know that essentially in this case the probability that you find the electron upward is one half and one half or downward. So what you start up with, what you end up with, sorry, is the statistical mixture. You repeated the experiment many times and you have this branch which is that and that branch underneath which is that one. This is a statistical mixture and you immediately run into a problem because if you didn't know anything, and I remind you that we want to go to cosmology at the end, this is the point, our starting point, with the actual uh, electron coming in. And this is a pure state, and that goes to this statistical mixture. But you could have started up initially with the same statistical mixture, and you ended up with the same result. So there is no way to raise the degeneracy between these two cases. Well, one way to do it would be to take your stern Gerlach apparatus and rotate it along the, 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 the x direction, because this is an eigenstate of the x direction. So if it is this thing, you rotate this thing, and you find that there is only one measure at the end. So this was this state. But if it was the mixed state to begin with, then it will be that lad, like that. So now, of course, what happens when I throw only one electron is completely unknown. I know that the electron will arrive here or there, but I don't know why. And I have no idea what, what will actually happen. 
Unfortunately, this is the case for the universe. That's what we are doing nowadays. So this is the essence of the measurement problem. And I didn't want to use the example of the Schrodinger cat because I like cats and I'm a little bit upset that many people want to kill these cats all the time. So, but this is, this is a, a better way of seeing that. So the, the measurement problem has many solutions. There have been many, many possible solutions that have been proposed. Do not worry, I will not enter into the details of all these things. This is very well summarized in this pretty old, now that it's 10 year old uh, physics report by these men, gentlemen. There are many possibility of modifying Schrodinger equation or modifying quantum mechanics in one way or another that will reproduce, that will solve in a way the, the, the measurement problem. The most usually, I mean the most used uh, way of doing that is by using the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics and, and which some people say that it also provides you with the Born rule and as far as I can tell and as far as I can ask any other any reasonable people about that this is just not true it is hand waving argument which are usually circular so you have if ever you hear some people and in the cosmology community you might actually hear someone called Slava Mukhanov saying that and I'm really sad that he's not around here to tell him in but, okay, if you can see me, on, uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to discuss that with him. But the arguments usually are circular, and the many world is not providing the Born rule. And why am I insisting on the Born rule? Is that I'm going to present the hidden variable formulation of quantum mechanics, which renders the Born rule dynamical. And it is not something which you put by hand. Now the Born rule ends up being dynamically uh, derived. There is also a possibility to modify the Schrodinger uh, the first Schrodinger equation by adding nonlinear and stochastic terms, which I would have discussed if I had time, but I strongly suspect that I won't. But if you misbehave, I still have a couple of transparencies about this one as well, so I can spend another half an hour speaking about it if needed. Right. So I will discuss <coughs> more, in fact, I will concentrate more on the hidden variable formulation, because I think these things, contrary, I mean, there are various claims on these topics, but Generally, what you find is that these formulations of quantum mechanics are essentially actually really equivalent to quantum mechanics, including the Born rule. Now, one of the reasons why people would do that, uh, quite apart from the usual measurement problem in, uh, in quantum mechanics, is that you want to apply quantum mechanics to cosmology. Because otherwise, the measurement problem, in a way, is sort of philosophical. Okay, you don't know where the electron is going to arrive on your screen, but it does not really matter, technically speaking, because you can really repeat the experiment, and this is more akin to philosophy than anything else. And since we're not philosophers, we want to do something which has to do with physics and which is measurable. Now, in, phys in cosmology, we have something which is the singularity problem. I don't know if it's been discussed on the first day, as far as, far as I can tell, it was not discussed since then, but anyway, it's simply the case that when you calculate the scale factor of the universe, whatever the con material content of the universe, you always find that at some stage pa in the past, the universe started with an initial singularity. And the initial singularity means an, uh, an, in an initially divergent energy density. An energy density which diverges reminds you automatically of classical electrodynamics and the black body radiation. This is the classical Maxwell theory, which is telling you that um, for short wavelengths, the, the energy contained in a black body uh, is infinite. And you know that when you apply quantum mechanics correctly, then you find the Planck, the Planck law, which is perfectly well and finite. That was the idea underneath the pre Big Bang, which is telling you that you have this singularity going down, and perhaps if we apply quantum mechanics intelligently you know, in a clever way here, then this will smooth it out just in the same way as the black body radiation. So in fact, and since I have in mind applying, it to, applying quantum mechanics to cosmology, I need to uh, first present quantum cosmology because it is the simplest way. I will just present quantum, quantum gravity in a, in a canonical formulation, and then move on to cosmology and then change or oh, do all these changes. So quantum cosmology is very simple. In fact, you just have, you write down uh, general relativity in a Hamiltonian way, which is you split space-time, well, 
you, have a, you make a three plus one split, which is essentially you split time in space, time into space and time. So you have a time-like vector n, and anything which is orthogonal to it will provide you with hypersurfaces, uh, which are uh, making a full foliation of, of the universe. And you see the definition of a couple of things. And then you can write the metric in terms of a, ter of a lapse function in these coordinates, the lapse function, the ship vector, and then the intrinsic metric of the hypersurfaces. So this n here is then normal to each of the hypersurface. And this metric here is in, from this three-dimensional metric, you can calculate the intrinsic curvature tensor, tensor here and the extrinsic curvature tensor, which is also called the second fundamental form. This is just silly mathematics, but you can write down all these things in a very simple way. And you can rewrite the Einstein action. You see, I'm also doing a little bit of GR. You can rewrite the Einstein actions in terms of these variables. And when you actually do that, you end up with this form in terms of this second fundamental form and the, and the curvature uh, in uh, the three-dimensional curvature plus an extra matter. Now you go to the usual, um, you get back to your Landau and Lifshitz uh, lectures in classical mechanics. You have all these degrees of freedom. From these, you define the canonical momenta by just deriving the Lagrangian function with respect to the time derivative of whatever degrees of freedom you had. And you find something, whatever it is, it's irrelevant. You find a set of primary constraints because nothing depends on the lapse and the shift vector uh, time derivative. These are the primary constraints. And once you have the canonical momenta and the, action, the Lagrangian, then you've, you built out the, the Hamiltonian, which is taking this very simple form. Then you vary with respect to your variables. So one of them is um, the lapse function. The lapse function doesn't appear in the final Hamiltonian. So that's telling you that h equals to 0, h being um, the initial, the, the, fun, the thing which appears in this place. So you have the Hamiltonian constraint and the momentum constraint. And this reproduces basically all GR, that's a classical description, a Hamiltonian classical description. Then, now you forget about your Landau and Lifshitz book and you go back to the Dirac book, who is uh, going to tell you that uh, what it is you need to do to quantize the theory. So to quantize the theory is very simple, I mean, at least in principle. You, first of all, you need, as I said, um, a space of state, a Hilbert space of state. So what you find is that the relevant configuration space is first of all the space of all three metrics, because I told you that the lapse and the shift are actually not dynamical, um, not dynamical quantities. So you have just the three-dimensional metrics as part, as part and with, uh, depending on the parameters which are the, the, the coordinates in space-time, and then you might have an extra couple of matter fields, but we know how to quantize matter, so we don't really bother about these things. And then, of course, you know that GR is invariant under diffeomorphism, so you take this space of uh, Riemannian possible uh, three space, and you quotient it with uh, the space of diffeomorphism into the sigma hypersurface, and this is the object called superspace. Of course, this is an object which is mathematically horribly badly defined and with which you can basically do essentially nothing. But technically speaking, I mean, practical, you can do that. Now, once you have the phase space, then you have the wave functional, and the wave functional will, will depend on the, uh, on the degrees of freedom which you have, namely this, uh, the metric and the fields, whatever they are. And then, as I said, you open your Dirac book, and Dirac is telling you that you want to do canonical quantization, meaning whenever you see um, a canonical momentum, then you replace it by minus i times the derivative of the, of the wave functional with respect to whatever variable this thing was the moment of, and you have the wave functional, this thing, and everything is settled. Now you write down whatever I wrote before. First, the primary constraint, having applied this thing, and you see that the wave function depends neither on the lapse nor on the shift, which is what I said before. I could have assumed that it does and found out immediately that it doesn't depend. So you have the momentum constraint, which is slightly uglier, but which is basically telling you that the wave function is the same for all configurations that are merely related by a coordinate transformation. So in fact, this thing is sort of trivial if you are working only in the restricted superspace. If you are working in the space, in all the space of all possible 
um, metric, then you have to apply this constraint. But actually applying this constraint is restricting attention to superspace. So in fact, at the end of the day, you have only one equation which is uh, dynamical, in a way. And this is the Hamiltonian constraint. This is the last equation which we had, which takes the extremely simple form of h psi equals zero, and which takes a slightly uh, less simple form when you actually expand this h in whatever it is, which it is. Yeah. When you say related by a coordinate transformation, do you mean by spatial coordinate transformation? Uh, spatial coordinate transformation, yeah. And so you see you have this ugly equation with this so-called DeWitt metric. This is so the well-known Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which again is very nice and you're very happy that you derived that, but it is completely useless because there is absolutely no way you can solve this thing in general. Just like in GR, when you write down GR, the Einstein equation, you're very happy, but you cannot solve them in general. So what you do, you do whatever physicists do, like Lorenzo told us, uh, you restrict attention to something which is simple, and then you justify it, of course. And <clears throat> you will take this infinite dimensional configuration space to only a two-dimensional configuration space, which is going to be the mini superspace, in which you restrict attention to metrics that are only depending on time through a scale factor, but otherwise are the other one, uh, friedman lemaitre robertson walker metrics. I mean, the special part of it, homogeneous and isotropic. And then for the matter, you just restrict attention to, say, a scalar field or something else, anything which will be only depending on time. And the funny thing is that the willow de witt equation now becomes a Schrodinger-like equation for a wave functional depending only on the scale factor and this scalar field. So um, since I'm supposed to be honest, uh, being a physicist, uh, well, okay, <laughs> forget this first one. Uh, there are a couple of conceptual and technical problems here. Uh, one of them is that, first of all, you might have noticed that there was an infinite number of degrees of freedom, which I reduced to basically two, this, uh, in, of course, you may ask the question, is this mathematically consistent? Um, I shouldn't say that. I should actually unplug the, the thing to say that, no, it is not mathematically consistent, and this is well known. And in particular, this is from the mathematical point of view, but from the physical point of view, it's even worse, because you are freezing an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And when you freeze this number of degrees of freedom, you automatically freeze the momenta. You just forget about everything altogether. You factor out everything. So you're freezing the momenta as well. But I mean, freezing a degree of freedom and its momentum is a little bit bizarre in view of the, the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. So this is, physically speaking, a little bit weird. But even that you're assuming isotropy and homogeneity, in a sense, you are saying that you have maximum uncertainty in the function. Absolutely, absolutely. So there would be a way to try to say... The well, this is exactly why it is normally, I mean, if you fix this configuration to be of an FLRW, uh, universe, then anything which is orthogonal to that will have an infinite momentum, essentially. So, and you're not considering these things. So you can always put that under the carpet and say, well, this is, you know, you put that in a, in a normalization factor in your path integral, and this, everything is infinite anyway, never mind. But conceptually speaking, it's a little bit problematic. So the way out of that, there are two ways out of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody does that, but not everybody is sufficiently honest to recognize they do that. So that's why uh, I'm just trying to be as honest as possible because there are students around, so it's better that they also know what is happening in the real life. And the best justification I know of is that if you take quantum field theory and you take the, the mini superspace limit of quantum field theory, restricting attention to just a few degrees of freedom, what you end up with is quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics works and is really supposed to be the restriction of quantum field theory in very specific situations. So this is a good reason for doing that, even though we know that mathematically it is inconsistent, and physically it, it is weird, but it works. And the second reason why we should do that is even more convincing, because then we can do calculation, and otherwise we can't. So otherwise I will just stop my talk here, but now I can go to actual calculations. And let me take an example which is also the example that has to do with uh, what I was saying with the singularity, related with the singularity. Let me consider quantum cosmology for a perfect fluid. So I take the very simple example. As I just said, I have this lab function, which I keep uh, for simplicity here, and then I restrict attention then to the mini superspace. 
and I consider a perfect fluid. So there is a very nice formalism, which I should advertise here, provided by uh, Bernard Schultz in the 70s, which is telling you that if you have a perfect fluid with constant equation of state W here, you can rewrite everything, the pressure, in terms of a couple of velocity potentials. I'm not going to enter into the details of it, but you can write the pressure in terms of some velocity potential. And playing around with things, uh, in particular dif modifying things through canonical transformations, for instance, to define this T variable, which is a combination of these ugly velocity potentials, but it is not the case here, the problem here. And doing things like canonical transformation, rescaling, changing of unit, whatever, I can end up with an extremely simple Hamiltonian for this case in a mini superspace. And this extremely simple Hamiltonian is the following: is this one? You see, you have the curvature term, you have the canonical momentum associated with the, sc the, the scale factor here, and then you have just the canonical momentum associated to this variable here. And now, obviously, normally people complain here because you know I have a Hamiltonian which has something which is linear in the momentum and something which is linear in the momentum immediately makes you feel like, well, there is an instability here. I mean, there is something which goes to minus infinity potentially. So let's see how it works. You know, I write down the willard wheat equation, which I said is just h psi equals zero. And now I apply that, I apply the Dirac, uh, the Dirac canonical rules. And in, I simplify just for the case k equals zero because it's simpler, but then I can define this new variable and I find that, first of all, you see this is the momentum applying uh, to uh, this thing. So what happens is that when you have a fluid, the fluid actually defines a time-like uh, time -like vector and therefore it defines a time. So from the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which you had it, which was the willard wit constraint, then you end up with a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And it, is, it makes sense because you actually have a time in cosmology, even though this is another problem we can discuss some mm -hmm. other time. And you see what you find is uh, a Schrodinger equation for a massive particle in, with no potential. It, it's hard to find anything simpler than that. And recall that we started with the willard wheat equation, which is one of the most complication, complicated equations we have in physics, and still we can have that. Now we implement the fact that the scale factor is positive and that gives you a constraint. And once you have a constraint, you can solve this equation under this constraint, and this is what you end up with, which is a Gaussian wave packet. You have the well complete solution in terms of this t, which is the time essentially, and x, which is the scale factor. You know, you have the full wave function with its phase, which is given by that. And now you have the wave function of the universe. And now the question is, what do I do with that? You know, I have the wave function of the universe, which is essentially meaningless. Basically, I need to do something else out of it. Because then I will derive the probability of observing the universe in whatever state, and so what? So we need to go one step further. And that is where I'm going to introduce you the hidden variable theories. So I hope that the situation has evolved a little bit for the last 10 years, and that nobody is going to rush out of the room assuming that I am a crackpot working in a rolled out theory already and I try to convince you that it is not the case. So first of all, I will not do anything fancy. I will just take the Schrodinger equation, which was that one. Now I'm back with even a potential if I want to complicate things. Just the simple Schrodinger equation. And I write down the wave function in terms of an amplitude on a phase. Up to there, no real problem. And then I write this thing, I put this thing into the Schrodinger equation and I separate the real and imaginary part and this is the reason why I wrote this S like that, because the first equation I end up with is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation in terms of ACE, which will be, then be the action in classical physics. Except for one difference, the classical uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation will be just this thing equal to zero. And here I have an extra term, which is, you see, a very bizarre looking term, because it's the Laplacian of A divided by A itself, so it's definitely a non-local term, even if the amplitude of the wave function, for instance, if it is an L2 function, then the amplitude goes to zero asymptotically. That does not mean that the quantum potential goes to zero asymptotically. So you see you have possibly non-local effect that will enter into this theory. But this, this is the only difference with classical mechanics, which, um, which is the reason why uh, some people decided to push the analogy a little bit farther, and these people were uh, Mr. De Bruyne. And in where, where is the, where is the hidden variables? Not yet, not yet. 
For the time being, this is purely standard quantum mechanics. Then the polemics will come later on. Don't worry. <laughs> You'll have it. And I knew someone would leave already. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because it doesn't go to zero when the wave function goes to zero. So the quantum effects can actually still be around whenever the wave function is vanishingly small. Is vanishingly small. But I will go into these things later. Don't worry. So now I'm back to this. So the so-called, first of all, ontological interpretation. The, the Breuil, Bohm interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is twicely wrong, because first of all, it is not an interpretation. I will come to that later. And then it's, I mean, ontological is a very bad word because usually when you see ontological in, a, in an article, it means it is a philosophical article. And usually you just throw that away because you are a physicist and you're not interested in philosophy. I mean, if you're a real physicist. Sorry, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or a bad physicist such as myself, if you prefer, I have this way. So, okay, you have this. So this gentleman in 1927, during the Solvay meeting, presented this so-called ontological interpretation, which I'm going to present. And then von Neumann, the great mathematician, made a mistake and actually proved that the Broglie theory was impossible and incompatible with quantum mechanics. And it was a rare case where you have a very brilliant and famous person making an actual mistake. And that was in 1930. And he was so famous and so renowned that you had to wait until the 50s, actually the 60s, before John Bell because he had seen the paper by David Bohm, who was essentially rederiving the same theory as De Broglie. And as John Bell said, well, I, in 1952, which is the, ta the time where David Bohm had his paper, I saw the impossible done. Impossible meaning something which was incompatible with von Neumann th theorem. So there was a theorem which was simply plainly wrong. And that's why I think John Bell published uh, some, a paper to disprove uh, von Neumann something around 1962 or 63, something like that. It was just before the Bell's inequality. And that's what drove Bell into this, uh, into this game. So in any case, almost immediately when De Broglie presented his, uh, his pilot wave, you might have heard these words as well, uh, pilot wave version of quantum mechanics, immediately after the 1927 Solvay meeting, this was completely uh, put away. Nobody will consider that seriously. And the legend comes that, in fact, you know, the Solvay meeting was essentially based on the Einstein-Bohr discussions, which actually were discussions over breakfast and dinner, and therefore do not even appear in the proceeding. This is what people, reasonable people, would call propaganda, I think. You know? Like the history was made by the winners. This is exactly what happened. And so in any case, people did not like it. I think there are many reasons for that. One of them is that De Bruyne was a prince or a duke or whatever, and he's a noble person in any case. And usually physicists are kind of democratic people and they don't like noble persons. So they were happy to uh, despise his theory. Whereas on the other extreme of the spectrum, uh, Mr. Bohm was a communist, well known to be a member of the Communist Party of the United States. And he, was actually he had to flee the United States during the McCarthyism, and that's where he ended up in Brazil, and which is explaining you why there is a large school of Bohmian physicists in Brazil, thanks to Mr. McCarthy, <laughs> bizarrely. So in any case, what I was saying is that instead of mentioning the interpretation, I'm now going to refer this to the ontological formulation of quantum mechanics. I think the word formulation is better because it, uh, it encodes the fact that it is just the same thing, the same theory. A little bit better, I'd say, but just the same theory. So let me go back to this, the ordinary, the usual quantum mechanics. As I said, this is what it is. And now this ontological formulation is just assuming the, the following. It's just assuming that there exist trajectories. So the particles, they are at some stage, at some point in space, and they move in time. So they have a, a, a time like a space, a, tra a trajectory in space time. They do have that, such a thing. And again, I remind you that the wave function is A and S. And they follow the De Broglie condition, which is the guiding, the pilot wave equation, the guiding wave equation, which is nothing more than the, the, the econal approximation for light rays in ordinary electromagnetism. So De Broglie was uh, working in optics before he moved to quantum mechanics <laughs> at some stage. So having recognized that there was a wave-like behavior uh, to, to, the, uh, to matter, 
which was far more brilliant than just imposing quantization conditions, but forget about that. And it, was, it would just imply that the momentum of whatever particle was associated with the trajectory, the momentum was just proportional to the phase of the wave function. This is the same thing which you have in optics. That's just light ray trajectories, essentially, when you have a wave propagating somewhere. So this is one thing. Now you take this equation, you derive it with respect to time, you take into account the rest of the Schrodinger equation, and what you end up with is the Bohmian trajectory, which is essentially the same thing, except that now you see you have a second order differential equation that's just Newton's law, which is again one of the reasons why people don't like this, uh, this vision of quantum mechanics. Some people think it is too classical, because it's back to classical equation, you see the, for the, the acceleration times the mass is equal to the gradient of the potential, which is a, just the force, times the, plus the gradient of the quantum potential, which is this thing, the gradient of the quantum potential, which is also a quantum force. But people don't like quantum force because the force and a trajectory is not quantum by definition. Right. So, but the Bohmian trajectory for some reason is, I mean, this Bohmian formulation is not very nice and I will explain in a minute why. So I'd rather restrict attention to this De Broglie formulation. And these theories have a, have a few properties. First of all, if you assume that, now you see the difference is that you're saying that there is a particle distribution function. So all the particles are somewhere and there is a distribution function and the square of the wave function in ordinary, uh, the, the ordinary Born rule, it is telling you that the square of the wave function is the probability to measure the particle at the point x at time t. Whereas here, the, the only subtle difference is that this psi square is the probability that the particle is at point x and time t. And that's the only difference, essentially. And now, so you, you, you have a wave function and then you populate it with uh, many trajectories. Yeah. So it becomes a statistical theory. Yeah. Okay. So you have many, you know, you repeat the experiment, meaning you start with the same state and then you throw particle in that state somehow, and the particle are following so trajectories. So equation is just for one trajectory? For one trajectory, okay. absolutely. And you'll tell us in how to get the ensemble of trajectories. Yeah. By just putting well, I'm thinking so soon that it's going to be right now. I'm just assuming that I have a probability distribution. And what I will show later on is that if I start from with anything, any probability distribution, I end up with the Born rule. I will show that in a minute, in a few minutes, at the rate I'm going. I don't know if I will ever show that. Anyway, so this form of particles. So now you're assuming that you have the wave and you're throwing a particle and by throwing the particle it's essentially telling you that you start with a particle and you put it here and you look at its evolution. And then you wait for the end of it and then you repeat the experiment and you do it again and again and again. And that's the probability distribution for your particles. Which is the same thing that we, you will do in ordinary quantum mechanics, it's just that you would not assign the probability of being somewhere, but just the probability of measuring the particle somewhere. This is the only difference. Now the advantage is that the classical limit is extremely well defined. As soon as the quantum potential goes to zero, then you are in a classical state. And you see this is not the case, this is not the same thing as telling you that the, the object is big. Because a big object can have a wave function that goes to zero with, uh, I forgot, I got rid of it, with the quantum potential which does not go to zero. So, this is a crucial difference. Then this emphasizes the fact that uh, the, the quantum mechanics depends on state. Very often people are so used to using WKB states, for instance, that they even forget that well, you need to impose one particular state. And there exists an intrinsic reality, which is the particle has a trajectory. This is in reality, which means ontological, anyway. Unfortunately, you have to pay a price for that, and the price is that the physics in law is non-local but then it is a choice. Either the particles don't exist at all and then all of a sudden they materialize somewhere, but everything is local, whatever that means, because local has to do with where the particles are. So this is, or the particles do exist, they propagate, but they propagate in a non-local way. And of course, there is no need for any classical domain, any, cl any external observer, because everything is self-contained. Let me take an example, which is the most famous one, the two-slit experiment. You throw particles there and then they propagate and they reach a screen and you measure an interference pattern. And this is what you have then. 
you send, look at the trajectories of the Bohmian trajectories, and this is the trajectory of the particle. So you have these two slits there, and the particles arrive here, and then it is deflected by following the phase of, uh, of the wave function. That's exactly the, r the right question. Now, the thing is that you start uh, not here. In fact, you start there, where you have the source of particles, which you send. And you see this is a first-order equation. So the momentum is given by the, the theory. So what the only thing which you need to impose to begin with are the positions. So you have a statistical distribution of position here, say, whatever it is, whatever you want. And then you throw them all. That's the, that's the hidden variable. That's the hidden variable, yeah. That's the initial distribution of particle. Bizarrely enough, what is called hidden variable in this context are the particle's position, even though the only thing we ever measure in, in physics are positions. So we are classifying something as hidden, even though that's the only thing we ever measure, which is bizarre. But anyway, so... We can't measure momentum. No. How do you measure a momentum? Well, you measure the po your velocity. So how do you measure this thing? You just measure the position of, uh, of your object. And that yeah, gives you the momentum. I can, I can measure the momentum of something by measuring the position of the coffee. coffee. And that's always what you do. Or you measure the elevation of temperature, which is done by plugging a thermometer in it, and which has a position as well of the level which moves. I mean, you always measure positions. Position of a pointer, essentially, whatever it is. But it's always the position of the pointer which you measure at the end of the day. So some people, yeah. No, with the quantum potential. So it's Q which goes to zero, it's a classical limit. It's Q divided by V that goes to zero. Q much smaller than the classical potential. I have a classical potential and quantum potential, and as soon as the quantum part is small, then uh, the classical behavior is recovered. And I will show that in a minute. Yeah. But we can also mention the chain of time. The chain? Uh, position and time. No. no. When you measure time, you're actually also measuring uh, the position of a pointer in your clock. <laughs> measuring time is even more complicated than, uh, than momentum. And I, will, I can go to that later on. Yeah. No, if you change not the position, but the color, the color changes, not the uh, Yeah, well, OK, we can discuss <laughs> forever on these things. But it's, uh, OK, we can discuss. But I still have like 95 transparencies to show, so I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so. These, some people have said that these, part, these uh, trajectories cannot be real because they are surrealistic. You know, people don't like trajectories. They don't like it so much that they don't, like, they don't even like them when they do reproduce the data. So they're claiming that they are non-straight even though you are in vacuum. In a way, people which are criticizing this vision of quantum mechanics are criticizing it because it's too classical. And then they say that the particle cannot be straight in vacuum, therefore it is not classical enough. So they're criticizing from both sides, which I think essentially cancel both criticism. And you see, it is non-straight in vacuum, which is true in this case, because the potential here is essentially vanishing. But the quantum potential, of course, is non-vanishing, because it, uh, it takes into account the boundary condition uh, on all these places. And you see, you have these trajectories. And it is always a pleasure to cite uh, Mr. Feynman, who said that this two-state experiment is a phenomenon which is absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way, and in, by classical way, he had in mind trajectory kind of way, and which has which had the art of quantum mechanics. Well, there is a nice way of doing that. You can explain also diffraction by a potential and tunneling and all these kind of things by the same kind, by the same token. I'm not going to enter into that. I don't know if I have much time, but still, I mean, there is an impressive, very interesting recent experiment, which I just can't resist uh, showing, which has been done. You have a silicon oil bath on top of a shaker and you look at and you put droplets on top of that thing and the silicon when it's moving like that you can create sorry so-called faraday waves it's a very recent um, subject as you can see and the faraday waves are standing waves essentially and now you can <laughs> so you can make everything in such a way that actually the faraday wave is never really excited 
You don't really see it. You're just below the critical frequency at which it would appear. You can do these kind of things. And you have this shaker, and then you put droplet of the same oil, silicon oil is better, and the droplet will, you know, you know what happens is that normally you drop the droplet, and it actually bounces on the surface of the thing, right? And then you measure, you look at things, this is the droplet, which is bouncing on top of it. Anytime it bounces off, it creates a little wave on top of that, and this wave is actually going to guide the motion of the droplet. You see? And you, uh, you take it from the above and from the sides, and then you have the various results, just in order to, um, you know, to show off a little bit and pretend that I know what an experiment is. I would just present a couple of numbers. I have no idea what these are, but anyway. And this is what you end up with when you look at it. You see, this is, you see the droplet is moving here, and you can see one droplet or many droplets, which are creating a wave function, essentially, which is interference, which is having its own interferences and, and all that. So you have many droplets, or three, or how many, however you want. Now what you do with this thing, you start uh, putting it slightly out of phase, right? You, 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 you enforce a little bit too much the, 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 the shaking of the, of the object, and while doing that, then the droplet is not um, bouncing exactly at the trough of the, the wave, but slight, with a slight phase shift. And this phase shift is actually going to push the droplet in exactly the same way as in the Baumian view, as in the De Bruyne view, sorry, I should say De Bruyne. And you see when you do that, then the droplet is actually moving, you know, because of this instability. It's moving in one direction. And the direction is essentially arbitrary, as far as you can tell. It's completely well defined, but it, you don't really know. Now you can get rid of the vertical motion, and getting rid of the vertical motion you see something like that. And this is starting to resemble what we have in, in quantum mechanics, you see? Now you look at the trajectory, this is a, you see this was a spherical um, circular dish, and the particle just moves around in bizarre, uh, in bizarre ways. And it accumulates, you know, there, there's a color code with, depending on the velocity of the thing. And you see that the particle has various trajectories. The trajectory is very much involved. And you will accumulate with time, you see, and you have the velocity coding here. And at the end of the day, what you recover is the standing wave pattern. The standing wave which was never actually present. So this object is actually ending up doing that, you see, which is giving you the probability distribution function over time. And this is the square of the wave function, all of a sudden. And then you're going to tell me that there is no way to explain quantum mechanics in terms of classical physics. This is purely classical physics. You know, there is even a... The middle is the position where you start dropping... No, the middle is the peak of the Faraday wave, which again was never excited because you were below the Faraday threshold. You see? So that's, in a, in a movie way, the same thing which I just said, and that gives me enough time to finish my coffee. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, there is an external source which yeah. acts as an oscillation. Yeah, no, no, sure. It's, uh, and you see that's... Uh, okay, that's what you end up with. Yeah. Except you're, you're shaking the ground. Yeah, absolutely. It's dribbling, dribbling a basketball during an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if it is a good idea to do that. And you know, you can really check. The, you compare uh, the, the actual... This is the Faraday wave pattern, and this is actual experimental data. And this is really impressive. And you can even create quantized bound states, and they are quantized because of the wave. And you see, they, 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 can, they remain there forever. Basically, you have quantized bound states. And then you can do, uh, you know, by just adding some extra thing in, uh, in the oil bath, then there are, you can have places where the particles can't go. So you can put slits in this thing, and you have an experiment where the particle actually goes through something. And you see the typical trajectory. Here is the trajectory, particle trajectory. It's wave as wave front, and then it interacts with the wave. And this is the kind of trajectory you have. I mean, this is what can happen. Now you can look at one couple of different trajectories. You can imagine that the thing is going to be pretty much random. And in case you had a dot, this is another set of new trajectories. This is pretty much random. And uh, again, I think there is a movie to show that. It's even 
It was even in a, on the Science Channel, presented by Morgan Freeman. So it's kind of, it must be really nice. And you see these trajectories of the particle. This is really weird, and this is spectacular, I think it is. The Feynman would say that um, here you can take these films and um, watch the thing come through your sled. And whereas in the real um, two slit experiment with the electrons, when you try to do that, you get the, the only different momentum that it, it just Yeah. But that does not, absolutely, absolutely. But that does not tell you that there is no trajectory. That is telling you that indeed at the quantum level, when you want to see something, you have to hit something. And then you're back to the, pr the first interpretation of the, the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. In, the, in, the quantum, in, this, in this regime, you can see it without modifying the trajectories, but otherwise you could. So, but let me go on. So this is the one slit self-interference and the two slit experiment which is the prediction and the actual data. Which is what, this is the classical trajectory vision and this is the quantum trajectory vision. And again, I remind you, this is absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way. Okay, but now let me go back to quantum cosmology because that's what I'm supposed to talk about, not to entertain you with uh, Morgan Freeman movies. And going back to quantum cosmological wave function, I remind you that I had this wave function which made me thought, well, what am I going to do with that? Well, now I know what to do with that. I can calculate the hidden trajectory, which is the scale factor as a function of time now. And this is what I get. This is the general solution of this equation, of the Bohmian equation. And then I can plot it. Let's concentrate on this one. The rest is also for different curvature, spatial curvature can also be uh, negative or positive, whatever. But you see, you have, the, this is the quantum potential compared to zero, because there is no classical potential in this case. This is a particle in a box with no potential. And the classical trajectory is the straight line. This is for the radiation-dominated universe. So as a function of conformal time, the scale factor is just linear in conformal time. And you see it being actually linear. And then the potential, the quantum potential, becomes large when you reach uh, the quantum cosmological effects. And the big, the, then you have a bending of the, of the trajectory, and the, 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 the universe bounces. Right, this is a natural way uh, to solve the singularity problem. And it gets a little bit further because now we want to discuss perturbations. And when you discuss perturbation, it's even worse because you start, let's assume, you know, we all know these Kobe measurements back in 1992. But when you look at uh, the way things are usually done in uh, quantum, in, in cosmology, uh, you have a wave function for perturbation, and these perturbations are in vacuum. So in fact, the wave function does have the symmetry of the vacuum, which is homogeneous and isotropic. Right, yeah. Before you go to perturbation, can you slow you just a second? What is the hidden thing uh, in the example you, you just showed? Uh, the scale factor. Suppose, suppose I start with the, I could redo the universe again. What different evolution? The scale factor would have started from a different value. But still the Freeman law would apply because there would be the same relation between n matter. And absolutely, absolutely. Everything would have been equal. You would have started with a different scale factor. So and then the minimum size would be slightly different. The minimum size of the universe would be different. The only thing that would actually change, apart from, quite apart from the normalization itself, would be indeed the bounce case because the, the, the wave function acts basically on the bounce and nothing else, and in no other places. So again, back to perturbations now. Perturbations are uh, homogeneous and isotropic, meaning, in fact, the wave function is not that. The wave function is a superposition. I mean, I'm pretty bad at doing these things, you know, so please don't judge me on these drawings. But you take the wave function and you, you just rotate it in one way, one, one direction, another direction, another, all possible directions. And then you know that the actual wave function is a, is a superposition of all possible uh, realization of the vacuum such that the stress energy tensor sandwiched into this wave function is actually zero. Delta T mu nu in psi psi is zero. So it is homogeneous. So unless you measure it, according to Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, unless you measure it, you have a, a wave function which is a superposition of all possible states because you are in vacuum and the wave function has the, str the, 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 the symmetries of the vacuum. So it's homogeneous. 
So if you really insist on having Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, you must assume that the wave function of the universe collapsed in 1992 where Cobby measured it. And then there was a further collapse in 2003 when WMAP uh, measured smaller scales. And there was an ultimate collapse in 2012 where Planck did measure it. So I think we will all agree that this is kind of bizarre interpretation of quantum mechanics. So Yet Yeah, that's small scale stuff. So uh, whether George Smith does his experiment correctly doesn't have that much. You know, it's maybe more entangled in George Smith's quantum state. Yeah, I agree. The statistical uh, properties of the there, distribution. So. Yeah, the statistical properties of the distribution are going to be right. But is it making any sense to tell you that the, the physics of the early universe changed in 1992? I think nobody would agree with that statement. Clearly there was some uh, BBN made the measurement. Okay, so the BBN <laughs> made the measurement. <laughs> there was a civilization. Okay. <laughs> so you see this is a, this is a bizarre thing. So uh, another thing is that what is done usually is that you're assuming uh, a background plus perturbation. And what people do usually is that they quantize the perturbation, but they don't quantize the background. And I was told when I was a kid that uh, you should not add up potatoes and bananas or whatever. And, you know, this is basically the action is uh, one which is uh, containing a classical bit and a quantum bit. And this is kind of bizarre. And now what you do basically for looking at the perturbation, you have, you expand the metric to second order, you define the Mukhanov sasaki variable, and you end up with the action of a simple scalar field with varying mass in Minkowski space. We all know that. This is all nice and well, but essentially you just put the scale factor which comes as a solution of the classical Friedman equation. What we suggest to do here... But this is a semi-classical quantization, so this is no, no more bizarre than, than a Hawking radiation. Yeah, no more. But, um, no, there are plenty of regimes where it is a completely valid way of doing things. You go, normally you take a wave function even for the background, actually I'm a little bit cheating here. What you do for the background is you take the wave function which, uh, uh, which uh, follows the WKB approximation and then it's very peaked and then you have a, a trajectory which is the classical trajectory. But this WKB approximation is, breaks down whenever the trajectory is not the classical trajectory. And that's, will, that will be the case in the Bohmian case, for instance. The WKB approximation mm -hmm. will break down at the, precisely at the moment where you will bounce, for instance. You know? And then the correct way of doing things is also done in, uh, in molecular physics where they do use uh, this uh, formulation. You split the Hamiltonian to, for the background and second order um, case and then you factorize the wave function into a zero order and a second order. And then this thing which will depend this A of T here, instead of coming from the background equation, instead of coming sorry from the classical equation, it's now becoming from the zero order quantization. In other words, it is the de Broglie-Bohm trajectory which you put. So in most of the cases, the de Broglie-Bohm trajectory is very close to the classical trajectory. So that's exactly what you should do. And if you do that in inflation, for instance, in most of the cases of inflation, it is perfectly fine and perfectly correct to do that because indeed the de Broglie-Bohm trajectory is exactly the same as the classical one. But not always. Now, the question is, as I was saying, uh, the, 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 uh, there is another question finally. This is the Born rule. We always assume, for until now, that the Born rule will be satisfied, i.e., that the initial statistical distribution of particle, perturbation, whatever, are in quantum equilibrium. By quantum equilibrium, I mean that the density, the, stati the statistical distribution is the square of the modulus of the wave function. And now, of course, the difference between the, the Broglie-Bohm formulation and the other formulations is that it can be different. It could be out of quantum equilibrium. And then let me show you how it goes by a very simple example of a particle in a two-dimensional box, two-dimensional simply for uh, calculational reasons, 
and for other reasons which have become clear later on. So you have a particle in a box and the potential is essentially an infinite square well of a given size. So you have a, a particle in a box which is an infinite square well. And the density of actual configuration satisfies the continuity equation. That's up to there, nothing fancy. And you, we can calculate everything in this, uh, in this configuration. We can calculate the energy eigenfunction and the energy level. And we can start in a non-quantum equilibrium. Let's assume the following. You have a wave function. The actual wave function, which you are going to consider, is a superposition, say, on four uh, four different energy level of various eigenstates, right? You have the eigenstate, you have the phase, you have everything, you know everything. So you know the Schrodinger evolution of this thing, and then you know how it, it evolves, because everything is known analytically. So this is the typical square of the wave function of associated with this configuration. But now, in this formulation, the actual distribution of particle is not necessarily the same as the square of the wave function. So let's assume that it is something else like this thing, for instance, just one single, one single wave. Clearly, this is very different from that. You know? And then you look at the particle's trajectories. The wave function is a little, it's quite involved. It has uh, nodes all over the place, places where the wave function vanishes and all that. And at the place where a wave function vanishes, the trajectory becomes very much involved near the node. So you have very weird uh, trajectories which are looking like that. These are the typical example of a configuration. I don't know, it starts here and then it moves around. It's just really messy. And as you can see easily, if you take two such particles, two such positions, uh, where am I? I? I think here. In the graph here, you cannot tell the difference between the two initial configurations. And this is one final one and the other one is there. In other words, you will have chaotic mixing of all the trajectories. And this is beginning to remind you of thermodynamics. You, know, you look at the particle's trajectory and they will eventually mix. So what happens, for instance, is that you start with this initial configuration. That's the density and this is psi squared. You see psi squared is evolving like that and the density is very rapidly evolving, relaxing to something which is comparable to the psi squared. That's what I was saying. Psi squared in this theory, in this formulation, is an attractor. You start with something which is completely unrelated with psi squared and you end up with psi squared. Right? You saw that with a color code rather than a three-dimensional thing. Same, same thing apply. And you see that the chaotic mixing provides a relaxation towards equilibrium, which is exactly the same thing which you have in, thermal, uh, in thermodynamics. So it's a, nice, it's a nice way of seeing it. And why did I show that? It's, okay, this is one particular case where you have this initial, the quantum distribution, classical distribution, which is that, I mean, bizarre distribution, and then you end up with that out of equilibrium. You do that with slightly less modes. It relaxes, too, into a slightly different configuration. You see that the phases are essentially the same in both diagrams, but the only difference here is that the, the width now is a little bit smaller. Guess what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to reduce the width of the distribution, i.e. the variance, i.e. the power spectrum, for very large scales with limited number of nodes, which is what I want to do. This is, this is the diagrams that caught our attention to do that. Now, back to uh, this formulation. I was saying that there is the first order formulation and the second order formulation. If it is a second order equation, you have much more solution than the first order equation. So what happened is the following, which is why I say that um, Bohm, Bohmian formulation was not very uh, nice in a way, is that you have quantum mechanics which is assuming that the density is psi square. This is quantum mechanics. Now you go to first order equation, the initial velocity is just the, the phase gradient, and this is the De Broglie formulation. I, uh, I was asked to, to call it first order and second order. My view of it is that this is De Broglie and the other one is Bohm, but it's not a good idea to say that Bohm is ruled out. So. And this is the second order equation where the initial density is still not psi square, but the initial velocity is not the gradient of the phase. And that the second order equation is unstable and the first order equation is stable, i.e. the first order, if you start everywhere from here, you end up to quantum mechanics. If you start anywhere there, you just go away from quantum mechanics. So the first order situation is well under control. The first order can be tested, and I will show you in a minute why and how. The second order has been tested and is ruled out. Now, 
I'm afraid I'm going to have to accelerate badly for the last 15 minutes. Uh, no, I know, 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will write down uh, the equation of motion for the perturbations, quantum cosmological perturbations in uh, the required form. Now that's what we do. What do you do normally with um, cosmological perturbation? You write down the classical temperature fluctuations, which are proportional to the Mukhanov variable, Mukhanov Sasaki variable, which are themselves proportional to the Bardeen potential, which is nothing but the gravitational potential delta G00. This is what you do. Now you want this to be a quantum operator, and this is to be a quantum theory, and this is extremely difficult. What you have to do is merely to put some ats on top of all these variables and then they become quantum operators in a Hilbert space, which is usually not very well defined, never mind. So as I was saying, the second order perturbed by Einstein equation is that of a scalar field. And then I will focus attention to the case where you have slow order parameters, which are defined in the usual way. And then again, that is a variable mass scalar field in Minkowski spacetime, right? Then I Fourier transform this thing and I have the modes here, and I have an action, a Lagrangian, which you can recognize as this particular Lagrangian. And from the Lagrangian, again, we'll do all the same thing of deriving the momentum associated with the Vulcan variable. I have the momentum. With the momentum, I can build up a Hamiltonian, which is just an extremely simple collection of parametric oscillators with time-dependent frequencies. That's extremely simple. So now I can go on to uh, the usual quantum mechanics. I factorize the wave function in terms of different modes, real and imaginary part of this thing, and I have this Schrodinger equation in terms of that object, which is just the Hamiltonian of a parametric oscillator. So everything is well under control, and we can derive everything. You have a Gaussian state solution, that is the background solution, the, the, the vacuum solution, that's a Gaussian state, and you can calculate the Wigner function. This is just an aside to show you that you have the right to do what you do every day, even though I'm arguing that you should do something else, but you have the right to do that because when you calculate the Wigner function, which is given by that, you start up with this initial condition, you let time evolve, and the Wigner function becomes extremely squeezed with a squeezing factor which is like orders of magnitude larger than anything that can ever be accomplished on Earth. I think the squeezing parameter that the best we can manage is like order five or something like that, uh, whereas inflation provides a squeezing parameter of 100, uh, 120 or something like that as well, so it's, it's just amazing. So this is so squeezed that the shape of the Wigner function entitles you completely to forget about quantum physics and to replace everything with a stochastic distribution of classical processes. And then what you do is that you apply this ergodicity system and the variation the, the fluctuation, temperature fluctuation depends on the realization and spatial direction, and then you assume that you have this equivalence between the average quantities. And to calculate the primordial power spectrum, I definitely won't have time to do that, but anyway, you have this equation, as I was saying, parametric oscillator, I will skip these things. You write down everything in terms, you have the solution in terms of this uh, omega function here, and from this you derive a function f which is giving you the mode equation, which is this equation which normally people solve. And what happens is that here is the typical inflation uh, system. So you have different wavelengths which are formed here. You have the phase of inflation, radiation, and matter in terms of, um, in terms of the e-fold number. And this is the Hubble, wavelength, Hubble scale. Right? So you put the, the harmonic oscillator in a fundamental state here. Then you have a parametric amplification when you are, when you are super Hubble. And then eventually you measure it uh, at the end of the day. And you can do a little bit better, but set initial condition, solve everything. I'm not entering into the details. But you see that what you have for the perturbation again is that this equation here looks pretty much like um, a time-independent Schrodinger equation. So you can apply exactly what I was uh, proposing with the, the particle trajectories and all these kind of thing, and you can calculate the transmission coefficients, right? And then eventually, at the end of the day, you measure the variance of your uh, Mukana variable, which gives you the power spectrum, and then the power spectrum of uh, curvature perturbation, and you compare that with the data in a slightly more involved way than I did, but I don't want to enter into this. At the end of the day, you compare your theory with the data and you're very happy everything is working very well. Not that well around here. And, okay, you leave me five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
maybe just to, okay. <laughs> now, I will go very quickly. Recall you have this Hamiltonian. Instead of solving this exact Hamiltonian, we move to a very a simpler way, a simpler system, which is the one we had before. I take only a spectator scalar field in, the expan in an expanding universe. And then I start with, you see the field, I expand it in the real part, an imaginary part, and the Hamiltonian takes this shape. And in the end, hmm, where is that? I think, all right. And I replace uh, this uh, scale factor case by the mass and this by omega, and I write down an equation, which is exactly the one we had for the two particle in a box case. So we start with the same Schrodinger equation as in the two particle case, and we know what happens. In the, you, saw, you see, we know what happens. We, say, we start with a quantum wave function, which evolves this way, and an initial distribution, which is not the quantum wave function, and it evolves in a different way, in such a way that, as we know, this is just the same thing, you, we relax to psi squared. Now, when you are considering a mode, which is, now this is true in a Minkowski, Minkowski universe. Now, when you're not in a Minkowski universe, there is, uh, there is a, when there is an expansion, there is a retarded time meaning you can re-express everything by just changing the time variable. This is the usual time, and this is the retarded time. For a mode which is super Hubble, for a mode which is super Hubble, you find that the time essentially freezes. So if you start out, out of equilibrium, you, and the mode becomes instantaneously super Hubble, it freezes out of equilibrium. And then when it enters again, back again into uh, the universe, it will have an imprint on the CMB. Right, that's the idea. What happens is that you conserve the shape during inflation. You see, you start with that, you end up with that. You start with a more complicated thing, you end up with the more complicated thing. You, start, you keep the shape, but not necessarily the size, the width. And the width is the power spectrum, and that's what you measure. So we want to freeze the, the PDF out of equilibrium. So without expansion, as I was saying, you have something here at the end of the day, this is the same. With expansion, you get something which is not exactly the same. It is actually smaller. You can measure the out of equilibriumness. You should see, uh, without expansion, it goes to equilibrium. With expansion, it freezes out. Again, that's the same thing again and again. So the, the typical idea, it's a bad model, I know, I don't even believe in it, but the idea would be to have a pre-inflation case where you have, say, radiation domination, then you, put, you can impose initial condition that satisfy the WKB case even on uh, super Hubble, case, uh, super Hubble uh, wavelengths, and then they are super Hubble, and they remain super Hubble, and therefore they remain frozen out of equilibrium, and that's what happened. You know, I was saying, again, you have the initial state, as I was saying, you have an out of equilibrium initial density. So on very large scales, sorry, these small wavelengths here, they, they will be below the, the, the Hubble scale here and again enter there. And from here, they, they have plenty of time to equilibrate. So they will equilibrate. And for these small wavelengths, we recover the usual result, right? The usual spectrum. But for large wavelengths over there, very long wavelengths, they are out of the Hubble scale and they don't have time to equilibrate and they remain frozen at all times. And eventually you see that there is, you expect to have less power on large scales. In practice, when you actually do the calculation, you find that the power sp spectrum is the usual quantum equilibrium power spectrum times a psi function, which takes this particular form depending on the representation of the calculation. And it is, uh, it is an inverse tan, which the best fit with that is an inverse tan with a couple of parameters. And this is the typical, uh, the typical case which you can find, where again, as I was saying, small angular scales are fine, exactly correct, and large angular scale present themselves with a small deficit. And of course now, you can ask the very simple question, is it a better fit? And so some people are very happy to just calculate a chi-square there and say, well, it's better by a factor of one or two out of 1,400 or something like that. <laughs> so it is a sort of um, statistically irrelevant. And anyway, so we decided we should not do that. And that's how I'm going to stop pretty soon because then uh, we put that in, in chain system having these three extra parameters. And we have done, and we just, you know, we have done this uh, with Sandro Vitenti and, and 
Anthony Valentini. We are just currently doing it right now. Um, but you see the difference. This is just to emphasize the difference between uh, our function and then running and running of running on different scales. Normally people don't think about that. The, the changes are very slight, really. I mean, normally if you get that, that or that, never mind. These things are slightly different. That's the power spectrum. And you see we have this function with a couple of parameters and we fit them. So we, we, run, we run many chains, but unfortunately, let me just skip that because otherwise the chairman is going to kill me. And so finally, oops, sorry. Shit, other way around. Uh, okay, so the, the full model, yeah, okay. So the full model, basically, you have a prior, you just put a prior on this variant. You can analyze this model. What you find, the most funny part of it is that you find a spectral index which is very red. It does not really converge for the time being. So this is really pre preliminary result. But preliminary results show that the, 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 the actual spectral index is much redder than you would expect otherwise. So you have to renormalize it somehow. And there is a, a, a typical quantum scale uh, which is provided, it seems to be converging. And then this is unfortunately incompatible with the prior which we put. And at the end, that's one we have. Okay, and the full model now is everything without any prior. So we find an NS which goes like that, quite red. Not that red, but almost converging. And then we have a slightly less converging uh, quantum scale, as you can see, which has two options, very large or very small. And then, unfortunately, something which has not converged yet at all. So uh, we cannot, uh, in summary, this is the kind, the, the, the kind of constraints which we have at the end, which are quite, I mean, there is nothing I can conclude on, on that point for the point being. But the problem, I mean, this is uh, I'm really, really, com I'm going to conclude now, uh, that really we can use cosmology to test different formulation or different extensions I mean, if you ask me the question in the, in the question time, I have a couple of transparencies and a different extension of quantum mechanics uh, doing um, nonlinear and stochastic uh, modification of the Schrodinger equation. And we can also use these things to the primordial and apply them to the primordial spectrum because we have this prob the measurement problem and the quantum to classical transition problem in cosmology. And of course, we still have much more work to, be able to do about that. And if anyone is interested in uh, working on that, please, you are very welcome to uh, turn to me and, and ask me to work with me. I'll be very happy to do that. Okay, and I, I stop here.